All right, Titus for beginners. This is lesson number two. This is Titus's mission, Titus chapter one, verses 15 and 16. So we've said that in the pastoral epistles, which are 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus, Paul specifically warned and equipped these two preachers to deal with various forms of heretical teaching called Gnosticism, which was circulating in many of the early churches, especially those made up of Gentile converts. Didn't have this problem so much where it was mainly Jews, Jewish converts, but where there were Gentile converts. Um, predominantly, Jewish churches struggled with false teaching from the circumcision party or the Judaizers. That was their problem. Okay. And the Judaizers, they insisted that Gentile converts to Christianity had to first be circumcised and keep certain food laws and other regulations before they could become Christians. Their thinking was that Jesus was the Jewish Messiah, and so those who wanted to be the, uh, His disciples must first become Jews and adhere to Jewish laws before they were Christians. It kind of makes sense you know, from their perspective. I could, I could see them thinking that. But that was the problem in churches where you had predominantly Jewish converts, the problem of the circumcision party or Judaizers. The churches where Gentiles were in the majority also struggled with false teaching, but the heresy being promoted was rooted in Greek philosophy, and it was referred to as dualism. Dualism. The teaching was different than what the Judaizers taught, but the goal was similar. Both groups required a kind of a works type approach to salvation. You had to do something. You had to do something in order to be saved. The Judaizers, they demanded circumcision and obedience to Jewish law as a condition to salvation. The Gnostic teachers promoted severe restriction of the flesh, food laws and celibacy, to free the spirit from its evil flesh and thus be with the good God. Right? So both of these groups were in error and they taught things that contradicted what Jesus and the apostles taught concerning the gospel of salvation, which is freely offered by the grace of God and received by man on the basis of faith in Jesus Christ and that faith expressed in repentance and baptism. We read that in Acts chapter 238, a familiar passage. So in this letter to Titus, Paul outlines the practical way that this preacher was to guard against both false teaching and the teachers who promoted these, um, these heresies. One, uh, preserve and pass on the sound doctrine that he had been taught. So Paul is telling him, you know what I taught you? You maintain that exactly as I taught you and you pass that on, that's, that's your responsibility. And two, train and appoint sound leaders who will do the same thing. Because there was only one of Titus, but there were many churches. He was in, located in Crete, and so there were, apparently there were many churches in Crete, so he couldn't be everywhere you know, at the same time. So he was to appoint leaders who would be able to preserve the gospel as it had been taught by Paul and taught to Titus, and then Titus taught to these people, uh, and um, uh, they were to uh, then lead and teach the church in the same way. Okay, so let's review our outline in order to fix the point that we are at in our brief study. Uh, pretty simple outline, the salutation. Uh, Paul talks about his mission, chapter one, verses one to four, and his mission is he wants to preserve and pass on sound doctrine um, and wants uh, uh, Titus to do the same. Uh, the body, Titus's mission, chapter one, verse five to 311, uh, he is to appoint sound elders, the word sound, not sound like I, can, I hear a sound, but sound as in solid, dependable, okay, sound elders, uh, chapter one, five to 16, and provide sound doctrine. So that was Titus's mission. Then the conclusion, a couple of verses at the end, personal greetings and some final instructions. So last week we covered the salutation 
And in our lesson today, we're going to examine uh, a portion of Paul's instructions concerning Titus's ministry. So Titus's mission, first of all, he needs to appoint sound elders. So verse five, he says, for this reason I left you in Crete, that's how we know where he is, because he says it in his letter, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. So just this one verse, we find out a lot of uh, information. Paul had used Titus in various ways in the past. For example, he sent Titus to Corinth to monitor this church's progress in light of uh, Paul's first letter uh, that had specific instructions. And we find out in 2 Corinthians about Titus' involvement, 2 Corinthians 7, 13 to 16. After Paul's release from his first Roman imprisonment, we know that he traveled to, to various places to preach for example, he went to Crete and he returned to churches that he had previously established in order to encourage their ongoing faithfulness and to provide for them you know, further instructions concerning their personal growth in Christ. So in verse five, Paul provides the historical context and purpose for this letter. He had preached and had begun a church in Crete but he couldn't stay long enough to mature the groups that were formed there. This task he leaves to Titus, along with the instructions contained in this letter written and sent to Titus during his brief time of freedom, somewhere between 62 and 64 AD. Titus, therefore, is left to organize the church for worship and for service. One of his tasks will be to appoint elders in every city. Now there's a lot of information contained in just this one phrase, as I, uh, as I mentioned. He says, to appoint. Now appoint, the word here in the Greek, does not mean to pick and choose. Okay, you're going to be an elder, you're not going to be an elder. Uh, yeah, you, you, you can be an elder. It's not like that type of appointment. Uh, appoint, in this sense, is to set into place those who qualify to lead the church. It's a, a longer process is, is what I'm saying. Paul's written authority gives Titus, who is an evangelist, the practical authority to officially commend certain qualified men into positions of leadership. All right? Note also that he is to raise up elders, plural, plural. He could have said, you need to raise up an elder in every church, in every city, but he doesn't. He says you need to raise up elders, plural, in every church, in every city. Apparently there were several cities that had churches and each church was to have multiple elders in the local assembly. Um, we're not going to look at all the examples, but if you look at other examples where Paul is talking about elders, uh, he always uh, refers to them in the plural. There's never, uh, th there is no occasion in the Bible where they refer to one elder over one congregation. It's always a plurality of two or more anyways. People say, where do you get that idea? You know, that, uh, where do you get that idea where uh, uh, <laughs> You can't have just like one pastor. You know, one guy is the pastor of the church. Where one pastor over you know, a 5,000 member church or a 50 member church. Uh, is that a, a kind of quote, a church of Christ thing? And uh, I tell him, no, that's not a church of Christ thing. I said, that, that's a Bible thing. That's a New Testament thing. Just go into the New Testament and you'll find out. There is, no, there is no congregation in the New Testament that has only one pastor. They all have a multiplicity, a multiple number of uh, leaders or elders. As they, uh, you can call them different things, pastors, elders, shepherds. It all refers to the same person. And we've talked about that in uh, First uh, uh, Corinthians. Um, another thing that we, uh, that we uh, find out, no one man was made bishop or elder over uh, several churches. Each congregation, um, each congregation had its own leadership comprised of several elders. You know, many commentaries uh, describe Titus as the first bishop of Crete, and they argue that as a kind of you know, he was a kind of an archbishop. 
that he was appointing uh, other men under his authority to leadership positions in the church hierarchy. Well, that's, that's reverse history. That's not taking what the Bible says and making you know, a point out of it. It's taking what has evolved over the centuries in various denominations and then taking that idea and stamping it back onto the New Testament. But that's not what the New Testament teaches. The New Testament teaches that there were only, you know, uh, there were elders and deacons and there were teachers and evangelists you know, in one congregation, but you didn't have a situation like we see here, you know, like in Ro Roman Catholicism or in you know, general Protestantism where you have a, a hierarchy of leaders over the, all of the congregations. So in this thinking, you know, Titus was the archbishop of Crete and uh, uh, he would appoint a bishop in one city and then that bishop would be over several other pastors in individual congregations. That's the, that's the modern denominational model. That's, this is not the this is not the Bible model. I put Titus' name there because that's what they do in, in many uh, commentaries. So this is what you see if you look at this passage, as I say, from a Catholic or Protestant denominational view. It neatly fits you know, a preconceived notion concerning church organization. However, from a biblical viewpoint, allowing the New Testament to speak for itself and to interpret itself, Titus was an evangelist. He wasn't a bishop, he didn't have that title. He was not a pastor, he was not an elder. He was an evangelist. And the evangelist's work is to plant and organize churches by preaching the gospel and teaching God's word. How do we know that? Well, have you read Titus? <laughs> I left you in Crete to do what? To organize what was left to, to do. And to do what else? To appoint elders. He's not an elder, he's an evangelist. Evangelists, especially in the early church, served many different congregations who were at different stages of development. Titus, for example, was not in charge of all the churches in Crete, but he served all of them as an evangelist. Today, what do we call it? Circuit preaching. Our missionaries in Africa and in Haiti are very much circuit preachers. There are many congregations there that don't have a full-time evangelist. Many of them are rural, poor, can't afford to support a full-time evangelist. So our missionary uh, preaches at all of them. You know, one week he'll be at two or three he'll, you know, during, on a Sunday, and then the following week he'll go to two or three others, and then you know, he circuits, he has a circuit. And he trains men there for leadership. Ultimately, he will appoint some as, as elders. That's the model we have in the, uh, in the New Testament. Once these men were put into place as elders, they were the ones in charge of their local uh, congregation, not Titus. So once Paul states the overall mission, which is to raise up elders in every city, every church, he provides Titus with details regarding the type of men that he needs to look for, and that's what Chapter one, verses six to nine is all about. Now, there are similarities with the list of qualifications given for elders in 1 Timothy, you know, chapter three, verses two to seven. Similarities between that list and the list that uh, Paul gives to Titus, but Paul adds more detail in his letter to Titus, and I'll explain why um, in, a, in a moment. So let's... Um, <laughs> Let's read the qualifications he talks about. In verse six, he says, namely, if any man is above reproach, the husband of one wife, having children who believe, not accused of dissipation or rebellion. So a man who cannot be accused of a wrongdoing or a moral failure in or out of the church, he's above reproach. Nobody's going to step forward like a year into his eldership and say, this guy, well, he, you know, he robbed the bank and got away with it and never got caught. You know, the, he's not going to be, there are no skeletons out there. There's nothing that someone can come and you know, bring reproach uh, upon him. Also having children who believe, 
important element. Not accused of dissipation or rebellion. Dissipation, wasteful living, rebellion, you know, you know, uh, charging against authority. Uh, he says, um, another qualification says, the husband of one wife. As mentioned in the study in Timothy where this same phrase is used, a one woman man whose married life has been clear. He mentions also having children who believe and behave. All this is in verse six. Not only children who have been baptized, but those who conduct themselves as Christians. As I say, rebellion is disobedience, dissipation is wasteful living. You know, the idea is if a man has not succeeded in forming a lasting faith in his own children, why would the church give him the responsibility for the faith and the spiritual life of the church? I mean, you'd think you love your own children you know, more than you love your brothers and sisters in the church. It's only natural, it's human nature. Of course, you love your own children. And the point is, if after loving your own children, you haven't succeeded in you know, forming faith in them, how will you do that for those who are not that close to you? Sometimes that's a cold idea, you know, because some men have very good qualities about them. But uh, Paul is laying down very strict conditions for the one who will uh, be a leader uh, in the church. He then says in verse four, uh, in verse seven, he says, for the overseer must be above reproach as God's steward, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, not fond of sordid gain. So Paul has mentioned the need to be unaccused in the family or in society. Here he repeats this qualification and he provides details on how one acquires this qualification among those in the church. You know, how do you gain that qualification of being beyond reproach? So he begins with negatives. In other words, what the elder should not be. And he says he should not be self-willed. In other words, he can't take advice. He can't take correction. He has to win every time on every issue. He can't be that way because again, uh, if, if elders lead as a group, it's going to be a, <laughs> those meetings are going to be pretty tough. If you've got four, five, seven, eight men, none of which can take correction, none of which are ready to take any advice from anybody. I mean, we're not going to get very far, right? Uh, he says, not quick tempered, of course. Just think about it. Think of a meeting. Now. Just think of having a meeting with uh, seven or eight men. They're all elders not quick-tempered, able to control his emotions, his tongue, able to see somebody else's point of view, not addicted to wine. In other words, he's not a drunkard, he's not addicted. The, the operative word here is addicted, not addicted to wine, to drugs, to alcohol, to ice cream. Oh wait, that's too close to home. Uh, not addicted to shopping, not, you know, not addicted not an addictive, obsessive personality, not pugnacious, not a bully, easy to provoke, oversensitive, a brawler. Again, think, seven, eight men in one room discussing difficult issues. Not fond of sordid gain. In other words, a man, uh, not a man who enjoys gambling or other, uh, or, uh, you know, or other forms of immoral practice to gain money. Some people will work you know, three times harder to collect money from a scheme or a theft rather than honest work in their business dealing. I'm always amazed, you, ever, you know these, uh, what they call heist movies? You know, a gang of guys, they're going to go in and they're going to break into the central bank of Norway or something, you know, and the, most of the movie is all the equipment that they have and the drills and the special stuff and the planning for months, meticulous planning. And, and in my mind, I, I'm too much of a realist, I'm thinking, why don't you just get a job? You know, I mean, you'll make good money with these skills, you know, but the, no, you know, uh, the idea is to, you know, win something over, get something you know, over someone in a, in a dishonest way. 
Paul, uh, he then switches to positive virtues. So, so far he starts with negative. The, the elder must not be this or that, whatever. Now he switches over to positive virtues that a church leader has and continues to cultivate in verses one, eight, and nine. He says, but, so he mustn't be this, but he must be hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, just, devout, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching so that he will be able to both exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who uh, contradict. All right, so let's go over these um, one at a time. Um, he says, first of all, uh, a good steward. All right, so what is a good steward? Well, he's these things. He's hospitable. The, lover, the word in the Greek means a lover of strangers. Not only offering food and shelter willingly, but accepts those of different cultures and ideas and background. Hospitality is one of the most effective means of evangelism. Uh, loving what is good, a lover of what is beneficial. He loves doing good for others and seeing good being done. In other words, enthusiastic for good works. My, my wife has that quality. She's not a candidate for being an elder, but she has that quality. She's a lover of good. She's always enthusiastic for, you know, somebody has an idea, let's do this, you know, let's support that. Oh, she's, and I'm going, no, no, we've already got so much going. You know. But she's always ready to start a new thing, a good thing. You know. that, that quality, it doesn't reside only in men. It resides in people, but certainly, we want elders to have that quality. Sensible, sober-minded, not ruled by emotion, does not create drama for its own sake. A person who is prudent, because after all, he and the group of elders are responsible for the souls. So you want people that are prudent, that are careful, that are thinking ahead a little bit. A person who is just. In other words, conduct that meets the approval of the Lord as our divine judge. A man who is just lives in a way that is pleasing to the Lord. Uh, devout, uh, devoted to the things of the Lord, uh, devoted to God's word and His church, devoted to His ministry in the name of the Lord. Uh, Self-controlled, he says in verse eight, literally means um, uh, in control of strength in control of strength, means that the love and devotion to God is not spoiled by too weak a flesh, constantly returning to worldliness or too strong a zeal that leads to self-righteousness and pride. In other words, they're in charge of their emotional energy and their spiritual energy, because it can go two ways, right? Either back to the world, too easily tempted, that's, that's one way, or go the other way and be so religiously zealous that they, they kind of leave everybody back in the dust, you know, and they, you know, too, heavenly, what is it, too heavenly bound to be any earthly good, that type of thing. I call it spiritual realism, understanding that human beings are weak, understanding that we live in a sinful world. Now, we don't give in to that, we don't use that as an excuse. However, we understand that we're not living in the perfect world and the people are not perfect people. You know, as Christians, we're not perfect. We want to be, we're striving to be. We know we can't be, but it doesn't matter. We still want to be. Well, the leaders understand this idea that people are, are trying, they're doing their best. The, each family and each person has their own uh, you know, obstacles and, and problems and, and, and sins. You know. And so the, the leaders understand this idea. Um, holding fast the word of God in verse nine. The elder, like Timothy and Titus and Paul, must maintain the gospel and subsequent teachings received from the apostles and their disciples. They were not permitted to change or add or take away these teachings. In doing so, they would be equipped to teach the church with sound doctrine and also correct and refute false teaching that was contrary to what they taught. So the elders knew and they taught and they defended the faith given to them by Paul and his workers, and that would be Timothy and Titus. Again, speaking of lists, not a duplicate list of what was in 1 Timothy, 
but a complementary list of qualifications that confirmed some of the requirements. In other words, a mature married man with children, believing children. Uh, so once uh, Paul has outlined you know, the qualifications to look for in men to serve as elders, Paul reminds Titus why the church needs these kind of men. And so we read in verse uh, 10 and 11, he says, for there are many rebellious men, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, who must be silenced because they are upsetting whole families, teaching things they should not teach for the sake of sordid gain. And so he describes the character, the motivation, and the damage that these are causing at the church where, where Titus serves. So he talks about their character, uh, their rebellious, their disobedience to God's word, disobedient rather, to God's word, and those who teach it. Empty talkers, he says, their teaching and their opinions have no spiritual value and they produce no spiritual fruit. They're deceivers, he said. They're not simply mistaken or uninformed about doctrine. They know that what they promote is false. That's the hardest thing to swallow for many people. They, they're, quote, spiritual heroes that they happen to see on TV, the faith healers and whatever. You know. And many of them know that what they're doing is false, is not true. And Paul is saying to Titus, the people in your church that are doing these things, they know that this is not true. They're doing it for money. Open your, you know, open your eyes. Uh, in this case here, he's saying they're Jews because he says they're of the circumcision, but they're not part of the Juda Judaizers or the circumcision party, okay? Who were in error but believed that they were doing God's will. The Judaizers, you know, the ones that said you had to be circumcised to become Christians, he said those guys, they're mistaken. They're zealous for Judaism. They, they, for Judaism rather, they're zealous for Judaism and they want to protect the old ways. You know, they're wrong, uh, but what they're trying to do you know, is, is, is sincere. These guys were, were Titus's, the Jews who were teaching things where Titus was, they were not sincere. They were charlatans, they were doing it for the money. And that's what Paul is kind of specifying here. Their motivation, unlike the Judaizers who were guarding their Jewish heritage in the midst of a great change, these Jews um, uh, were motivated by greed and the love of money. They were religious hucksters trying to profit from the teachings that they knew to be false. And they caused damage. Titus is told to silence, to gag them, because theirs was not simply a difference of opinion on a religious topic, but teaching that compromised the faith and salvation of entire families. Remember, in those days, it was house churches, uh, you know, churches that had their own buildings and properties that came you know, later. At this time, most churches met either in a public space or they met in homes. So it was easy for these to infiltrate home after home to spoil uh, families one at a time. Um, they first overtake families with their false notions and then they use this as a base to address the entire congregation. So Titus and the elders he appoints should have the knowledge to be able to refute false teaching and they should have the confidence to block these types from speaking to the congregation without fear. Uh, the elders have the right to go to a, a brother who's teaching something clearly not biblical and sit him down and saying, we love you, we, we, we don't quite understand why you're doing this, but we forbid you from doing this. You're, you're not allowed to teach. We will not give you a class to teach and you will not teach this in this, in this congregation. They have the right to do that. How, how do you know? Well, because Paul gave Titus the right to do this and he gave the elders that he appointed the right to do this. So it carries on till today. Uh, we keep going, verse 12, he says, one of themselves, a prophet of their own said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. So here, Paul is quoting the Cretan, um, uh, it's a poem. The Cretan means from Crete, uh, uh, by the poet Epimendanes, who penned these words in a hymn to the Greek god Zeus, 
who is the sky god of thunder. So he's quoting a poem. Um, it was a generally held stereotype about Cretans, which was reinforced in popular culture with this poem. Uh, it's a little bit like generalizing about California, you know, being liberal, <laughs> being a liberal state, or all Canadian people you know, know how to play hockey. You know, it's a generalization. Well, this was a kind of a generalization about Cretans. Uh, even in poetic form, some made fun of the Cretan. So Paul confirms this popular notion and he says that the Cretans, in other words, the Jewish troublemakers from Crete, prove his point and confirm the stereotype. So he's saying you know, in the poem where it says that all Cretans are liars and so on and so forth, well this stereotype has been confirmed by the Jews who come from Crete who are causing trouble in the church. That's a long-winded thing to explain this one little verse here. Anyways, in verse 13b and 14, if you were wondering what that meant, if he was just going out of his way to insult people, no. All right, verse 13b, 14 says, for this reason, reprove them severely so that they may be sound in the faith, not paying attention to Jewish myths and commandments of men who turn away from the truth. So Titus's task is to reprove them severely. In other words, Titus is to silence these false teachers uh, who are spreading their lies for money and ruining the faith and the families in the process. So don't appeal, don't bargain, don't si just silence them altogether. In addition to this, Titus is to reprove those listening to their false ideas and jeopardizing their faith in doing so. So the reproof or the admonition will direct the members to stay focused on sound teaching. Uh, sound teaching coming from Paul or Titus or the elders that are appointed. And to avoid the useless and destructive ideas of the false teachers. You know, their myths and their genealogies and their man-made religious ideas as opposed to the revelation from God that Paul and Titus are giving them. And then, last verses we'll do today, he says, to the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but both their mind and their conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny Him, being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. So here Paul makes another reference to these greedy charlatans. He says, to those who are pure, mean, meaning purified by the blood of Christ. So to those who are pure, those who are purified by the blood of Christ, all things are pure. Why? Because believers know how to use all the things that God has created. For example, food is purified, how? Through prayer. Money is a tool to care for our needs and the needs of other people. Uh, sex is honorable and blessed within marriage. So you know, to the pure, to the Christians, all things are pure. We know as Christians how to handle all things in a pure way, all right? Then he says, to those who are unbelieving, nothing is pure. They eat without giving thanks and dishonor God who feeds them. Uh, money is a goal unto itself and without its connection to God, easily becomes an object of worship, idolatry. Sex is devoid of its spiritual component and reduced to producing simply physical gratification instead of being a facilitator for spiritual insight for which God created it. So Paul says that because of their disbelief and their misuse of spiritual tools, you know, teaching about God, both their intellect and their consciences are defiled, and thus they are unable, uh, uh, they, uh, and thus they are unable to get to the truth themselves, and certainly unable to lead others in the truth. Remember, he's speaking about these false teachers here. So in a final summary statement about these men, Paul says the following. First, they profess to know God and know Him in a superior way. Theirs is a statement only, only backed up with words. It's a self-professed spiritual maturity in knowledge. It's like when you drive by and it says, the greatest fried chicken sandwich in the world. 
And I ride by, says who? Uh, what contest did you win? Who, who? So you know, how many, the greatest hot dog, you know, the best, uh, I don't know, the best boots in the world. There's no proof of that. It's self-declared, right? Well, he's saying they're self-declaring. There's nothing behind what they're saying. They're saying they have superior spiritual knowledge and they know more than, than, than Paul and, to, and Titus. And he said, but there's no backing of this. They just, they're just declaring this, okay? Um, uh, Paul echoes James, where James says, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, I will show you my faith by my works, James 2.18. So Paul directs Titus and the church to judge these men based on their works, their deeds, their actions, not their words. Their deeds deny God because they don't produce what God wants. And what does God want? Well, an individual growing in faith and that faith expressed in loving deeds. That's what God wants, 1 Timothy 1 five to seven, and also Galatians five, six. These men are producing the opposite, loss or confusion in faith, as well as no good deeds motivated by love. So on the contrary, what's produced is debate, division, loss of faith, and no good deeds whatsoever. So Paul ends the teaching section concerning Titus's responsibility to raise up and appoint qualified men who will lead the church who will maintain sound teaching and who will deal effectively with those sowing division and discontentment and discouragement in the assembly with their false teaching and unspiritual lifetime. All right, so in the next section, the apostle is going to provide Titus with both an example and a pattern of the sound teaching that he wants this young preacher to maintain and to pass on to the next generation. All right, one more lesson to go and we'll be finished, Titus. Thank you very much for your attention.